all be seated. chapter 2. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David. He went to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. She gave birth to her firstborn, a son, wrapped him in swaddling cloths, laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And he said to them, The glory of the Lord had shone around. And they said, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and laying in a manger. And suddenly there was with them an angel, a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God. And they said, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary, she treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they have seen as it had been told to them. Father, this day, this week, we remember the events that have been recorded in your word. The coming of the Christ, and the birth of our Savior, we pray, O oh God, that we are always mindful of what this means to us. Not just a time to shop and to eat and to gather and to decorate trees, but the time to look into our lives and wonder why was this necessary? Why did the Christ come? We realize that you came to save us, to seek after us, to give your life for us. For our greatest need was redemption. And so you came to us as a Savior. And this morning, God, as we celebrate your birth, we also are grateful for your life and your death and the newness of life that you give to us. And I pray that as we celebrate this season, we do it first and foremost by giving our lives to you, surrendered, devoted, committed to be your follower for all the days of our lives, so that we think of you not only on a holiday like this, but we dwell on who you are always, our minds and our hearts always focused on you and your word, and always seeking your will, 
and always seeking the empowerment of your spirit to do your will. And Father, let this happen today in this service. Whether we're here in this place of worship or listening in our own homes, we pray, O oh God, that you will speak to us, challenge us, renew us, meet with us, and that this encounter will be life-changing for each and every one that comes into your presence today. Be blessed in our time together, we pray. In Jesus' most precious name we ask, amen. Good morning, everyone. Merry Christmas, and thank you for being here uh, this morning on our Christmas service. We are uh, just so excited to be gathered here. We're thinking about um, what will happen in the next couple of days, but before things get too crazy with the shopping and uh, the feasting and gathering in homes, how wonderful that we can start this week by focusing on Christ and worshiping Him. And so today I want to bring you a message, and this, uh, this month we're looking at uh, messages on who Christ is. And uh, last week we talked about, you know, an, an aspect of Christ, and today we will talk about Christ as the Word who was made flesh. I'd like to draw your attention today to the Gospel of John. If you have your Bibles, you can open to John chapter 1. We will be taking our reading from John chapter 1. I will be reading the first five verses, then I will be jumping to verse 14. John chapter 1, verse 1, reading from the English Standard Version, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. Verse 14, And the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. You know, many years ago, Harry Belafonte sang a song called uh, Mary's Boy Child. And the opening line of that song says, Long time ago in Bethlehem, so the Holy Bible says, Mary's boy child, Jesus Christ, was born on Christmas Day. I think Harry did not go far enough. For Harry Belafonte, the Christmas story happened 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem. But the truth of the matter is the Christmas story started way, 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 way before that. And we have the Gospel of John to thank. In the Christian Bible, we have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And each one of those Gospel writers write to a unique audience with a different purpose and with a specific goal of what they want the reader to know about Jesus. And I could have chosen from any of these Gospels this morning, but let me explain to you why I chose John. Matthew, the first Gospel, was written primarily to the Jews. And so Matthew begins his Gospel with a genealogy, starting with Abraham. Abraham begat so-and-so, begat so-and-so, begat David, begat so-and-so, begat Jesus. So what Matthew is doing to his Jewish audience is he's establishing how Jesus is the king of the Jews by linking him to the Abrahamic line and specifically the Davidic line so that Jesus is legitimately to the reader of Matthew the true king of the Jewish people. That's why he wrote it. Mark is unique. Mark does not even tell us about the birth of Jesus. Mark begins with the baptism of Jesus. So in Mark's gospel, Jesus is not a baby. In Mark's gospel, Jesus is 30 years old. That's how he starts. 
and he goes to the River Jordan, and he's baptized. And the reason for that is Mark is writing to the Romans, and the Romans are obsessed with power. They are the power of the day, and Mark wants the Romans to understand that Jesus is the most powerful, but yet his power is expressed in humility. And so by being baptized in the Jordan and by serving the people, Mark is telling the reader, Jesus, the most powerful being this world will ever know, came to serve and came in all of humility, a lesson he wanted the Romans to learn. Luke, on the other hand, is unique in that Luke is writing to the Greeks, the intellectuals, the thinkers. And the way Luke starts his story is he starts with the miracle pregnancies of, first of all, Elizabeth, who gives birth to John the Baptist, and then, of course, Mary, who gives birth to Jesus. And what Luke is trying to tell the Gentiles, the Greeks, is that sometimes God acts in ways that even our genius cannot understand. As brilliant as the Greeks were, there are still things in life you cannot explain, like a miracle. And the miracle of John's birth and the miracle of Jesus' birth is something that supersedes human intellect. And in doing so, uh, Luke was challenging the Greeks to think how amazing it is that a God can come as a man. God can come as a man. So that's why Matthew, Mark, uh, and Luke are written. Now we come to John. John is the most unique of the four gospel writers. Because whereas Matthew is writing to the Jew, and Mark is writing to the Roman, and Luke is writing to the Greek, John is writing to the world. He's writing his gospel with everyone in mind. So what do you do? How can you introduce Jesus when you have such a wide audience. How can he introduce Jesus to the Jewish thinker who is familiar with the scriptures, but at the same time reach the mind of uh, a Roman who's obsessed with power and conquest and ruling, but also reach the intellectuals of Greece who are always pondering, always philosophizing, and always doing things. And I think by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, John nailed his point by introducing to us the Word, the Word. Matthew said Jesus is king. Mark says Jesus is a servant. Luke says Jesus is a man. But John says Jesus is the Word, the Word. What is our greatest need? What is the most essential thing in life? You can argue that the most essential things in life are food, clothing, shelter. But maybe there's something even more essential to all of that. Words. Words. Because without words, how can you communicate your need for food? Without words, how can you tell someone that you need a drink? Without words, how can you ask someone to build a roof over your heads? It is our ability to communicate that is our greatest asset, isn't it? Our ability to make our thoughts known to someone. And communication is harder than you think. How many of you here are married? Raise your hand. You married people understand how hard it is to communicate with someone you love, right? Just when you think your hearts are connected, your minds are not. Have you ever said to something to your spouse and they completely didn't get it? Or they completely misunderstood what you said? It's very difficult, it's very challenging for you to take an idea. Our ideas are in our brains. Yeah? We have an idea, we have a thought, we have a concept. I, 
I need then for you to understand what's in my mind. So I have to find a way to take what's in my mind and put it in your mind in a way that is as, as exact as the original so that you are starting to think the same thing that I'm thinking. For example, if I say, if I'm thinking of a car and I say to you, car, are we then thinking of the same thing? Not necessarily. I might be thinking of an SUV and you might be thinking of a Corvette. I might be thinking of a purple SUV. You might be thinking of a red Corvette. So just because I communicated to you the word car, the word was not sufficient to take everything that I'm thinking and putting that exact same picture into your mind. You understand why it's now very difficult to communicate? You know, um, one time Anna gave me a list of something, things to pick up in Walmart. I was on my way to Walmart. And uh, in the list, you put shampoo, and then down the list, you put pencils. So I bought shampoo and I bought pencils. When I came home, I realized I bought the wrong thing. I showed her the shampoo and Anna said, well, where's the conditioner? And I said, what can, it said shampoo. This is a conditioner. But you know, apparently uh, with her, with the way she does things, shampoo and conditioner always go together. With me, it's just shampoo. And so I go, oh, okay, we'll go back. And then the next thing I gave were the pencils, uh, yellow number two pencils. And she said, oh, why aren't they mechanical pencils? Oh, b b because pencil. And that, that, you know, we laugh about that, but that's sometimes what happens in life, right? When we listen to something, we don't take time to clarify what it is we are being told. And so we assume we assume. And how many of you have gotten in trouble because of your assumptions? You assume you understood. You assume you heard properly. You assume that you know. Well, God couldn't risk miscommunicating Jesus to us. That he had to find a way to make sure that his word came to us clearly and powerfully in a way that was life-changing. And so John introduces to, uh, to us the word of God, the communication of God. And here's how he starts. He says, in the beginning was the word. See, Harry Belafonte says, long time ago in Bethlehem, that was 2,000 years ago, long time ago in Bethlehem. But John is saying, uh-uh, in the beginning, not 2,000 years ago, in the beginning, was the word. The Christmas story does not start 2,000 years ago. Neither does it start in Bethlehem. The Christmas story began in the beginning. Long before you and I were created, long before the world was created, there was already the beginning. And what was in the beginning? In the beginning was the word. The beginning was the word. Now, what's this word, world, word? The word word in the original language that John wrote, and John wrote in the, the Greek language, is the word logos, logos. In the beginning was the logos, and the logos was with God, and the logos was God. What is logos, and why is this the word that John chose? The word logos, of course, is most easily translated in English as word. Logos is word. It's, it's the word that you speak. It's the word that you use to communicate. But the word logos is also where we get the word logic, logic, logos. And we know logic to be reason, right? Reason, the cause. Everything in this world has a logos. Why is there a Bible. What is the logos behind the Bible? The logos behind the Bible, the reason behind the Bible is there is a printing company somewhere out there that decided to publish Bibles. 
And so that publishing company is the logic, the logos, to why I own a Bible. Why does this guitar exist? What is the logos behind this guitar? There is a company called Taylor in Southern California that says, well, we're going to make guitars. And so they take the wood and the metal and the strings, put them together, and therefore we have a guitar and the logos behind this guitar is the Taylor Company and the luthiers and the guitar makers. Well, what is the logos behind the universe? Why does anything exist? Why is there anything as opposed to nothing? And the reason there is anything as opposed to nothing is because in the beginning was the logos. In the beginning was the reason. What a perfect way to introduce Jesus to a universal audience. Remember, John is writing to Jews, to Greeks, to Romans, to everyone. And so he has to find a word to describe Jesus in a way that makes sense to everyone. See, to the Greek, the Logos was powerful because the Logos is the reason behind everything. The Greeks were fascinated with reason. They always ask questions, why, why? That's a question of the philosopher, right? Why? Why is there this? Why is there that? Why do people act this way? Why do some people behave differently? Why, why, why? And to the Greek, when John says, in the beginning was the reason, and the reason was with God, and the reason was God, then the Greek will look at this and say, oh, that's why. That's why there's anything as opposed to nothing, because of the word, the logos, the reason. The Jewish reader of John would look at that and say, in the beginning was the Logos. Oh, we know the Logos. We have the Word of God, the Old Testament, the Jewish Scriptures, the divine communication of God. The Jews had an image of the Logos where the Logos of God, the communication of God, is itself divine because it comes from God, but the Word is, is, is separate from who God is. The word is a, is, is a byproduct of his communication, but is uniquely an entity. And imagine what challenge this would be to the Jew when John will say that, but that logos is Jesus from God, but unique. And the Jew will have to grapple with that. The Roman, on the other hand, would read this <clears throat> and it will say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was in the beginning with God, and look at verse 3, and all things were made through the Word. All things were made through Him. And to the Roman that was obsessed with power, what greater power is there than to be the reason there's anything? The Romans can make Fortresses, the Romans can make weapons, the, the Romans can make chariots, the Romans can make swords and spears, but the Romans cannot make the universe. But this word, this logos, all things were created through him. And so in one sweeping few lines, John is introducing to us who Jesus is, that he is the logos, the reason, the cause for everything. If it weren't for the logos, we wouldn't be here. The logos is powerful. How powerful is the logos? He was there in the beginning. In other words, he himself has no beginning. He's eternal. What else do we know about the logos? The logos in the beginning was with God. And the Logos was God. He is with God in relationship. He is God in nature. And then what then do we know about the Logos? In verse 14 it says, And the Logos became flesh. The Logos became flesh. That is the Christmas story. 
It's not merely a stable in Bethlehem. It's not merely about Quirinius and Augustus calling for a census. It's not just that there were shepherds that came. It's not that there were wise men that eventually visited. The Christmas story is the logos, the reason, the cause of everything. The God who was in the beginning became flesh. And he made his dwelling among us. You know, Aaron reminded us that we can celebrate Christmas without Christ. Void of the knowledge of Christ and just get into the food and the lights and the festivities. You know, one of the most fascinating TV shows I've ever watched as a child was the Flintstones Christmas. Yabba dabba do. <laughs> you know what is fascinating about the Flintstones Christmas? It takes place 10,000 years before Jesus was born. <laughs> Jesus hasn't even been born and the Flintstones are celebrating Christmas. <laughs> Christmas trees, shopping, gifts. So in other words, the Flintstones Christmas is a Christmas without Christ. It is merely a holiday. It is a winter holiday. The trees are there. The gifts are under the tree. They do prepare the big feast. They gather with, you know, Fred and, uh, Fred and Barney's family. It is a Christmas holiday, but without Christ in it. And unfortunately, this week and this weekend, millions and millions and millions of people around the world are going to celebrate a Christless Christmas. They will eat, they will drink, they will shop, they will exchange gifts. Some will drink too much, many will eat too much, many will receive gifts that they don't need, and it will be void of the Word who became flesh. I wonder if that's anyone's fault but us and ours. Maybe it is the fault of the church that we have not communicated the Christmas message clear enough that the world has lost sight of what it is all about. And so today we need to recapture the meaning of Christmas, not by going to Bethlehem, but by going to the beginning. Because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word loved us so much that the Word became flesh. If you celebrate Christmas without Jesus, you have missed the point of the holiday. If you celebrate with food and festivities and gifts and lights and merrymaking, but have not the Christ in your heart, you have merely participated in a ritual for which meaning has been lost. Because John reminds us three very important things about this Christmas message. Number one, that the Christ we celebrate in Christmas is the pre-existent creator. Not just a baby, not just a cute infant that's lying in a manger. This is the one who created everything. This is the reason you exist. This is the reason why there is a world. He is the reason why anything exists as opposed to nothing. Secondly, John reminds us that this Christ is a source of life. Not, did, not only did he create inanimate objects, but he breathed life into what he created so that you and I today are living conscious beings. We're thinking beings, we're feeling beings, we're doing beings, we're human beings. And the reason we have life and enjoy life and live life is because in the beginning was the Word, in the beginning was the Logos. But thirdly, he reminds us that not only did he give us life, he became as one of us. The Word became flesh. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and made his dwelling 
among us. You know that phrase, made his dwelling? is the word tabernacle. Tabernacle. Imagine a Jew reading this for the first time, John 1. And when he read, and the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, what would the Jew think immediately? The Ark of the Covenant. The temple in the wilderness. The place where God would come and visit and he would dwell. And they knew that he was present because he was a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And as long as that fire was visible, that meant that God was with them. And John says, well, here's the new covenant. The word became flesh and he tabernacled among us. He lived among us. Christmas is about a God who knew that we could not come to him So he came to us. Christmas is about a God who saw our fallenness and saw us so depraved and deprived of grace and mercy that there's nothing we could have done to be restored in our relationship with him so that he took the time to come and restore his relationship with us. The Son of Man, Jesus said, came to seek and save that which was lost. He came to give his life a ransom for many. And I say this every year, there's two images that you should never, never forget. The manger and the cross. The manger and the cross. You should never think of the manger without thinking of the cross. Because the manger by itself is an incomplete story. That's why a lot of people know the Christmas story, but they don't know the redemption story. Many people know the child in the manger, but they don't know the Jesus who is the savior. The manger was the necessary vehicle by which the cross would be a reality. The Jesus that came as a baby did not come so that we can eat ham on Christmas Eve. The Jesus that came, born in a manger, came because we have a sin problem and he came to solve it with his death. That's why when the angel introduced to the shepherds the birth of Jesus, what did they say? Behold, a Savior has been born to you. A Savior, that's how he was introduced. Behold, a Savior has been born. How come? Because the one thing you should know about Christ is he is a Savior. If you miss out on that, then anything else you crave from him falls on the wayside. Christmas is a redemption story. Christmas is a story of a renewed relationship. And before we frantically shop and eat and gather this weekend, I want you to think about your relationship with a God who loves you. He came to save, but have you received this gift of Christ and eternal life? In verse 12 of this chapter, it says, But to all who received him and believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. Did you know that we are all children of God, but we are not all children of God? We are all children of God, but we are not all children of God. Let me explain that. On the one hand, we are all children of God in the sense that we are all the product of God's creation. Every human is the product of God's creation, and therefore every human is a child of God in that sense. But not everyone is a child of God in the redemptive sense. Because only those who receive him are given the right to become children of God. So when somebody says to you, we're all God's children, 
Yes, that's true, but it's also false. Because although we are all God's children in creation, we are not all God's children in redemption. In order to be God's child in redemption, you must receive the gift of Christ as your own and in return, give yourself as a gift to Christ as a disciple and a follower of Jesus Christ. And then you become a child of God. Christmas is about giving gifts. God gave us his gift, Jesus Christ. The gift you give to him is the gift of yourself. And so this morning, I want to invite you to give yourself as a gift to Christ. To say to him, it's not about being wrapped in paper and tied with a bow. It is about surrendering myself to him. And Christmas is most meaningful when we understand that it is about a restoration of a relationship between a God who made us, loves us, and renews our relationship with him, and then you and I accepting that gift, receiving Jesus as the grace and the gift and the promised Savior, and then living for him for all the days of our lives. So as we dwell in the meaning of Christmas from this very different, very cosmic, very unique perspective, you, you notice how John is the most different he gives us a very different angle on the Jesus story. Maybe we can dwell on this and think about the question, have you a renewed relationship with God? Not because of anything you have done, but because what he has done for us. Have you accepted, have you received the gift of Christ? And are you now restored in your relationship with him? With that, I want us to bow our heads. I want us to close our eyes. And I want us to experience a meaningful Christmas this year. Meaningful because I want you to be so assured that in your heart of hearts, in your mind of minds, you are in relationship with the God that loves you, through the Christ that died for you, in the power of the Spirit that dwells in you. And even if you have been going to church all your life, it doesn't mean that you are a follower. And even if you were born and raised in a Christian home and your parents are believers, it doesn't mean you are one. And just because you have a religious identity. Or maybe you were baptized as a child or confirmed as an older child. Or your name is part of a membership list in a church. None of that is significant. None of that is significant enough to be in relationship with God. Because only by God reaching down to us the Logos became flesh and tabernacled among us only when we receive that gift of grace and mercy, only when we open ourselves to his coming into our lives are we saved and redeemed and given the right to be called his child. And so if your desire is to become a child of God, would you just pray to him and receive him by saying, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for coming for me. Thank you for restoring that which was lost in the fall. Renewing creation. Restoring your rightful place in the hearts and lives of people. And taking your rightful place in my life. You are Savior and you are King over me. And this day, I receive the gift of Christ. I accept the forgiveness and the pardon through the cross. 
I embrace Christ as my Savior and I follow Him as my Master and my Lord to live as a disciple, to do Your will and Your bidding all the days of my life. And I ask for the Holy Spirit to make me strong in this commitment so that everything that must be done to fulfill the will of God in my life will be done through your empowerment in me, through me. And not only for me to enjoy the blessing of Christ, but to share Christ to others. May Jesus be the greatest gift that I will share to someone this week. By your grace, use me, Lord. Bless others through me. Make Christ known by the words that I speak and the life that I live, so that in all things you might be glorified. And men and women everywhere will indeed have a happy, a Merry Christmas, not simply because of the holiday, but because of the Christ of Christmas who follows us all the days of our lives. For this we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. If you're joining us online, thank you for listening in. And before we let you go, we'd like to give you an opportunity to continue to worship the Lord in giving. Let me share with you something very important today as we prepare our offering. Many of us have ties to the Philippines. Many of us are from the Philippines or are related to people in the Philippines. And you're fully aware that in the last couple of days, the Philippines has been hit by the strongest storm that it had seen in probably around 10 years. And the most affected areas is the central region of the Philippines, the Visayas, which is a part of the country that hardly receives uh, the beating of storms. But this year, they were hit hard. And many in you know, Leyte and Siquijor and Bohol and Negros and Cebu and even Palawan were hit directly by the storms. And I personally and, and some of our friends here have relatives in that area. And one of the most um, troubling things that I experienced is that in, during the storm, I had lost all communication with my relatives in the Philippines. Everything was down. Phone systems were down. Power was out. Uh, I did not hear from any of my relatives for 24 to 48 hours. Uh, yesterday, I, I was in touch with a few aunts and cousins, and they said the, that uh, it, it, they were hit pretty bad. We're also receiving reports from our churches in the Visayas, and we are starting to get a clearer picture of how bad things were. The preliminary reports, and we're still receiving more, but as of yesterday, we have several churches whose buildings have been damaged. There's two or three we know that are totally unusable. In fact, some of them met uh, in church a few hours ago, but they had to meet in the outside property. They were not allowed to go inside. Um, we have two pastors that we know of that lost their homes, completely demolished. So one pastor had to live in the church and another pastor had to live with a member and they've been doing that for the last couple of days. There's a lot of work that our Visayan churches need to do in order to kind of recover from all this tragedy and this devastation. We in the United States, the World International Churches in the United States, uh, we, I met with the pastors and with our, um, our U.S. overseer last Friday, and we made a commitment that all of the U.S. churches this morning will take a special offering. We will send it to the Philippines as soon as possible so that they can start buying the food that they need, the water that they need, and the materials that they need to uh, rebuild their homes and their churches. And so this morning as we take an offering, there's two things I want to ask from you. Number one is give your offering as you normally would. Whatever offering you had prepared to give, give that. You can put it in the basket that will be passed in a few moments or give online as you normally do. Zelle, Venmo, Pop Money, 
whatever you want. So go ahead and do that. But I would like to ask if you could find it in your heart. Beyond that, is there something you can give today for the relief efforts of our churches in the Visayas? And it doesn't have to be much. It could be five, it could be 10, it could be 50. Some of you can probably even afford 100 or maybe more. If you would like to give and you would want a specific portion to go to the Visayan um, outreach and the Visayan uh, mission, please make note of that either in your check or in, in your online giving in a note. Or if you're giving cash, please put it in an envelope that's available in front of you and write down specifically how much you want to go to the Visayan relief because that's the only way that our treasurer will know which goes to our general fund and how much will go to the relief. So however you want to give and however much you want to give, that is your discretion, but I would like you to know how urgent the need is and that we will send this to the Philippines as soon as possible so that even before the year is over, they can start rebuilding and we can start recovering. These are just some of the earliest pictures that were uh, sent to us. There's many more coming. There's actually in the bottom, um, in the bottom left corner, that is Win Pacifica, but not this. It's Win Pacifica in the Visayas. It's kind of like our sister church. You notice their church kind of tilted this way and so the government said they cannot use that nobody is allowed to enter that facility and so they have to completely maybe demolish that and rebuild that in order for it to be usable again and then one of our churches was completely flooded and uh, they have to clean that out hopefully not a lot of their equipment was was damaged but this is just these are just four of hundreds of pictures that we're starting to receive from our churches. They need our help, and let's make it a Merry Christmas for them by giving whatever we can. Amen? As the worship team leads us in a song of worship and praise, our ushers are coming, and if you don't want to give in the basket, please give online, and let's make sure we bless our brothers and sisters who are in need. God bless you all.